You're good. Hello, everybody. I think we're live here with Dynasty Warriors and also uh, some some more serious talk. I'm Austin Walker. Thank you for coming back to Save Point. Joining me for this segment, Rob Zachney, who has been here for the entirety of this uh, this this stream from from the jump, and also coming to us from the National Bailout, uh, Catherine. Catherine, whose hey, last everyone. name I don't think we ever exchanged, which means now I feel we bad. We didn't. <laughs> My last name is Labiron. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for joining us so much, and, and thank you for being part of this process. You know, Right now, we've raised $88,511.14, which is incredible. Yay. If you want to go donate, and I hope you go donate, you can go to uh, savepoint.stream. Um, Kato, could you do me a favor and make a tweet from the Waypoint account so I can retweet it that we're, that we're doing this, this talk? Um, and we're here with Dynasty Warriors, not because I am a long-term Dynasty Warriors stand and I decided when we have our national bailout uh, representative on stream that, <laughs> that we would just play Dynasty Warriors, but because when Rob asked you, what should we play, you said, well, I used to be a huge Dynasty Warriors fan. Huge, yes. So I feel like we should just like sit on this nice, peaceful encyclopedia screen for this opening talk and then once we kind of get into it a little bit i'll go into the game and start waging war in ancient china um <laughs> but i'd love to hear just a little bit about about you know who you are what you do at national bailout collective and and kind of what um what your your role is and, and what people are working on at the national bailout right now sure so hi everyone i'm katherine um, I'm on the advisory committee for National Bailout and National Bailout, also known as MBO, is a collective of organizers, activists and lawyers working to end free trial detention and ultimately mass incarceration. We are people who have either been in cages ourselves or have had our loved ones experience incarceration. Um, our collective includes people who are queer, trans, elder, immigrant and so on. We prioritize bailing out black mothers and caregivers through our strategic bailouts from jails and detention centers. Um, and we are also very, very, um, we, we really, really prioritize not only just bailing people out, but providing them with supportive services and building with them through our fellowships and, you know, dreaming and scheming about how we can create a world where we are all free and we, we all have our dignity intact, which is not the current system that we are living through. It absolutely isn't. Um, how did you get involved? Um, so I work at the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, where I'm the Gender Justice Program Coordinator. Um, and Fargi is one of the organizations who are on the advisory committee for National Bailout. So when I joined Fargi last year, I also joined the National Bailout Advisory Committee. Amazing. Um, Rob, you, you and Catherine have spoken a little bit, and, and why don't yeah. you take take it away while I try to figure out actually wait, I have a very important question here do you remember mm -hmm. when you played this game as when you were younger which mm. of the three major kingdoms of this of this series was your favorite uh, because that's who I'll play as today as as we continue to wow. talk uh, as, a, a as, as, a, as a reminder just to get you the, the, really it's the blue team the, the red mm -hmm. team and the green team right the blue team was like uh, well I just, may have just jumped in was Cao Cao who as a child I called Cow Cow a lot because I didn't know yep. any better um, uh, the green team is Lu Bei uh, and the Shu clan, and then the red team is the Wu faction, which I always went with because that just seemed like it made the most sense, you know, Wu Tang forever, even though it's a different, it's yeah. not the same thing. So I need you to tell me who you would prefer because I will play as them while we continue to talk. I think it's the blue. Okay, well, here we are. Yeah. So that worked out. See, okay. that's how it did nothing wrong. That's, that's how it did nothing so, wrong. That's my position. That's true. Anyway, Rob, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, Catherine, I thought one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is I think the, approaching uh, this issue, that of pretrial detention, from the standpoint of like caregivers in a community. Um, I think this is something that a lot of folks who haven't been through this and haven't been through the system probably don't think about, right? They think mm. of uh, the carceral state as being primarily one of the state and then individuals uh, as sort of atomized actors uh, in it. But obviously that's not true. What what does it mean uh, when people are put into the system, particularly when in you know their you know their day-to-day -day life they are caregivers, they are moms, they are providers. 
Yeah, so through our work at National Bay Lab, but just through our lived experiences as well, we can see that just even spending one night in jail could have such huge consequences for caregivers. It could be the difference between them having custody over their child or not. It could be the difference between them being able to maintain their employment or not, or housing. And it has huge uh, implications, not only on their physical well-being, but their psychological well-being as well, and the psychological well-being of their families. Um, so we really are prioritizing, you know, caregivers, black mothers um, and people who are always in the state of giving to their communities um, and trying to do something for them, to give back to them, to free them from these jails, but then also to build on their leadership so they can go back into their communities and ensure that other people do not end up in the same situation. Right. What is the what, what is the way in which you um, that, that specific last last bit there of like, how do you make sure that that you work towards a world in which it's not just about uh, helping those who've already been caught up in the system, but, but helping to uh, prevent more folks from, from being chewed up by a system that once you've entered it, it becomes increasingly hard to stay out of its reach. Yeah, so uh, through National Bailout, we have a fellowship where we're building on the leadership of the people that we, you know, help liberate from these uh, shackles in jails. Um, and through that, we are using this as a space to dream of them, to try and envision the kind of world that they would like to create, a world where we do not have to have a partial system, but instead we can employ community-based strategies to protect each other, to provide for our needs, because we know we can do it. Right. We've seen it being done in several, you know, especially using the African continent um, as a template. There are so many different communities and ethnic groups um, that have strategies and ways in which they use um, leaders within their communities to resolve conflicts rather than involving authorities. So we know it's possible, but right. then we also know that within our communities here in the US that there are ways in which we use uh, transformative justice and healing strategies um, to be able to move through conflict rather than calling the police. Why is it that you think so many people, and I, and I say this meaning in, including, let's say a lot of, um, if not leftists, certainly liberal folks, but, but even some on the left, um, have such a hard time imagining a world that has a, a substantial change to the way uh, the carceral system works, in fact, one in which it would be replaced entirely. Why is abolition so hard to imagine for so many people? I think it's um, because a lot of people benefit from these systems. Right. White people in particular, that, you know, that people are, all of these corporations are funding uh, these private prisons um, and people, are, you know, their families, like lineages, centered on the profit that's coming out of these uh, systems. The uh, forced labor that prisoners are forced to engage in, that many of our products and the things that we consume, you know, it's coming from, like, that's something that people cannot imagine living without. Right. And then I think also people, you know, they really hold on to this dichotomy of, you know, there's bad people and there's good people. So, okay, maybe we can free people who are in cages due to substance abuse, right. or maybe not people who have like, I don't know, stolen something. People have their way of like trying draw to draw that line. People. Yes, yes. But then we are, you know, we really try and push people to understand that people are growing up and coming of age in the system that harms them. And then if we actually meet people's needs, we won't need these systems to just cage people. Like people are not being rehabilitated right. through being in cages. Right. People have needs that are met in our society, in this capitalistic society. And if we were addressing those needs, if people were being given housing, if people were given quality education, if people were being given healthcare, if people were not in abusive households, then yep. we wouldn't see the same kind of things that we're seeing right now, regardless of whatever crime you see them commit. Well, like, and, and this is the thing that I think is such a deep-seated part of uh, especially American ideology is this notion of, of kind of um, individual, I, I think the right talks about it in terms of responsibility, but even, but even you know, the Democrats in this country like to emphasize the centrality of individual choice and action um, in a way that de-emphasizes the systemic causes of things like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, crime, uh, and, and fundamentally say like, oh, well, this is about what people decide to do, instead of recognizing that all of those choices emerge from a context that leads to them um, and, and have very little interest in addressing that context, because that context is fundamentally, like you said, profitable for them. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and and is I think you know we're we're in a in a in a very uh, frustrating moment I think. Um, uh, but the one hope that I have is that as we continue to see, um, you know, tensions rise and people uh, confront the, the fundamental injustices of the world that we live in. Um, both here and and throughout the world, and, and especially you know, given America's situation and the ways in which that it operates itself throughout the world, um, I hope that we can start to think about and understand the ways in which we can challenge those fundamental understandings of what it means to be, uh, you know, a, a citizen or be a person in this world, and and where responsibility falls. I, I, are you hopeful about the the coming days, or are you are you as stressed as the rest of us? Uh, quick um, question, Catherine, before you get into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Austin, if you could go into the game menu and maybe lower the volume. Even more. The... I need you to yes. know, yes, watch this. Look at how low it is now. And Welcome on top to of that, week. and on top of that, it's at 40% volume in Windows. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I believe I when I was playing Bioshock 2 earlier this week, it yeah. has a 10-point volume scale. Yes. I was down to 1. And people were being like, it's a little loud, um, which I don't understand how this happens, but that it's fine. is, uh, it's, it, it was I'm definitely a bit to... of a cognitive dissonance because yes. Minus Words has a sound we're having this conversation. Yes. Apologies. Apologies. Anyway, continue about, what was I putting you on the spot about? Whether or not you were fundamentally hopeful about the situation we find ourselves in? Yeah. Uh. No, I, I, I am. Um, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's draining and it's exhausting when we see, you know, so much violence against Black lives in this country on a reoccurring basis. But at the same time, being able to work with, you know, organizations like National Bailout, I'm able to see that our people truly have a vision that can radically transform our realities. Um, it's just that there's often times like sporadic support for this work. You know, right. like when there's huge headlines and there's, you know, mass movement then it becomes like a s- sensationalized thing that people want to support but on the day-to-day right you know when organizers on the front lines and there's no one making noise for like when black trans women are killed yep then those are the times that we still need support we need to support these people we need to continue to envision and dream so yes. really sustaining the movement is something that i think is critical but other than that i truly believe that we can get free um and I think we all need to hold on to that mindset um, that the work that we're doing today, it will feed the work of the future generations coming after us just as the same way that the civil rights movement continues to inspire us today right. and the movement before that. Um, so we just have to continue to like boost our energy and understand that even if it's not going to happen this second, it will happen. One of the things that I'd love you to talk a little bit more about is the is the fellowship because I one of the things that you keep coming back to is this notion of dreaming. And I think for people who have tuned into lots of Waypoint content, you you know that we talk a lot about failures of imagination. We talk a lot about the ways in which um, the the very method of control tends to be um, kind of siphoning away that feeling of possibility. But at the same time, I don't want us to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, the failure of, uh, you know, those who are oppressed to escape their oppression is in their own imaginations. Because one of the things that I think something like the work you do understands is that there's a material component to the ideological. There's a material component to coming up with and dreaming of a better world. And, and, and I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about how the fellowship kind of fits in with that and, and how the work you do uh, uh, addresses that material, limit. those material limitations on people working towards a better world. Sure. And maybe I can like start a different angle. Um, Please. Just, like, yeah. Take <laughs> yeah, us wherever you want. Like, Seriously. I will. Um, but of course, right now we're still in this pandemic, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I think one of the most uh, powerful acts of solidarity that I've seen is just the mutual aid networks that have yeah. been set up during this time. Um, and I think that's a great way of addressing the material needs of people. But it's not something that we have to rely on the government because we all know that these stimulus checks <laughs> <laughs> are not cutting it for people, especially nope. people who are you know, unemployed, people who are caregivers, people who are essential workers, people who are immigrants or undocumented. Um, yeah. There are ways in which like, whatever the government does, it's always going to be insufficient for us. So through mutual aid networks, um, we've been able to connect with our communities to address people's needs, whether that's groceries, or whether that's um, childcare, whether that's going to testing centers, any of their accessibility needs, but we haven't been doing it in a way that's just charity. Um, and from this, I'm speaking from my position as 
you know, a member of staff person at the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more than just giving someone a handout. It's sitting with them and building with them and providing political right. political education and being able to de- discuss these things so that when there is time for other movement, we can connect with these people and be like, you know, we need to move on this. We need to support this uh, call to action. We need to support this other person who's in need now that your needs have been met. So it's right. a way that we can really build solidarity with each other. Totally. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one thing I've been kind of curious about is how do you feel the conversation around these issues has shifted over your lifetime? Because I think it can be, it's it's an odd thing to think about in the, in the moment, it sometimes feels like change is not happening at all or there is actual regression happening. But sometimes when you step back and consider like, when I think about the way I heard these issues discussed, if they were discussed at all, when I was a child, the conversation is completely different now. And sometimes I do have to stop and remind myself that like, this is, there are concepts that are now mainstream that were simply not, right. uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I'm curious what you have observed in terms of the way people engage with these issues. Uh, how have you, like, how have you seen the conversation shift? How have you seen uh, feelings uh, change over time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think for me during this uprising, like it was really, really significant to see like abolition on the front of newspapers and stuff like that. Because honestly, I thought that was just something we speak about in like <laughs> on our secret like <laughs> signal, signal chats or like yeah. you know, uh, yeah, at the bar. Like you're not, yeah. you know, we don't actually get to say that word out loud because people think that you're you're speaking nonsense most of the time, right? At the most, it was just like, okay, let's defund the police or like minimize their budget. But right. to say like, let's abolish the police, like that was something I didn't think I was going to see like now, this mm-hmm. second. Um, so I think that was, uh, that in itself was something that really, really inspired and, you know, motivated me that like people could at least be able to like understand this language of what we're saying. And I still think that there's room to educate people because... I think when people are hearing abolition, some people are wary of it because they're like, okay, if you just destroy something, then what else? Like what happens to, you know, you know, how do we resolve crime and all this other stuff like right now? But the view of abolition is that it's not just about taking something away, it's about putting something in its place. And, mm-hmm. you know, allowing people to be part of the people at the table that will create what that is that will be put, be put in its place. Like we're not gonna just dictate it to you. We're in community with you, so let's dream of it. And, you know, we are in position to do it. Um, So, yeah, I think that has been a really significant thing. But then also I grew up in London, so there's been many shifts um, in how things have gone, Um, especially like, you know, growing up in England, like conversations around racism, slavery, colonialism, they were very much non-existent. Um, Like we really didn't receive like any education on racism, except for like, I remember my history class, there was one page on Martin Luther King. Um, and that was it. And then there was another little paragraph on Malcolm X where they told us we couldn't read it because he was too radical. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. You couldn't they read it? No. Wow. Incredible. Because I, I was that student that I was going to ask. I'm like, of I want to read about him. And they were like, no, we can't. So the first thing I did when I moved to the US in 2013 was like, I watched like the Malcolm X movie, yeah, yeah. read the textbook. Yeah. That movie's um, still good. That movie slaps. That movie, I watched the movie recently. I still think that movie's great. So. It is. We could talk about whether or not Spike has, has put out a real banger in a while, but like, I, <laughs> that movie, that movie still goes. Yeah. So we're very sheltered in the UK, but then also it's a way that blame is pushed to the US and right. the British try and act like they weren't involved in anything, even though they really were the source of a lot of this evil because you know people have to come from somewhere and it was right you know oh, that's what happened i just got rocked i gotta go heal sorry very important video game mm-hmm. bs right now uh okay okay i'm good i'm good i think i'm gonna be okay austin while you heal up um yeah you take a glance uh, apparently the audio is pretty desync is it possible uh-huh uh to mute the game audio and Kato can pull it from a uh, Discord uh, call that he's on. Sure. Is that doable for you? Uh, for but what do you, ask? like, I don't know what you, you want me to just turn Kato down? Kato send you a message. It's in, it's oh, in okay. I'll take a look at Discord. Give me a second. Um, but uh-huh. I think, I think to that point, uh, Catherine, I, I think this is something that 
has kind of struck me uh, is the degree to which Black Lives Matter is now this international movement. Uh, and I, I, I'm interested in exploring this conversation a little bit more in terms of there are... Let me, let me, th let me think back to... Um, like, I think in the United States, there tends to be, in terms of, like, blame fixing, in the U.S. for a long time, I think people who were in the northern United States or the western United States tend to think that uh, the problems of systemic racism, and if, if that term even occurred to people, a lot of times it, it did not, but those problems could be pushed off into, uh, you know, the old South, right? The old, the old Confederacy. And they were, they were problems of a region and they were problems increasingly people hoped of the past. And there was a, a lot of lack of awareness of all the ways that racism and structures of uh, like racial oppression existed across the country. They just looked different uh, than they did in old footage of like protests in the Jim Crow South. And I'm curious that sort of dawning awareness. Uh, how how has that unfolded in places like the like the UK? How do you go from kind of being a uh, certainly like in the northern United States? I think there was a lot of like racial obliviousness, uh, and then a sudden realization that this problem existed. How did that process? How does that process unfold uh, in the UK? And what what sort of tensions has it exposed? Uh, can you um, clarify the process that you were speaking to? Oh, uh, like realizing that um, structural racism is not is is also a local problem, right? The realization that that your society also has systems of racial oppression uh, that you thought kind of existed elsewhere, but weren't mm -hmm. you that did not implicate you. Sure. Yeah, I think in the UK it's uh, been unveiled by you know, the killings of black people at the hands of the police. Um, I think there's been this notion that the police in the UK do not kill people because they don't have any guns. Um, and that's been something that's been global. And then I think it's something that's also been internalized by people in the UK as well. Um, but then, of course, there are these special conditions where they can carry guns. Mm. And in those special conditions, we see that it's mainly black and brown people being killed. <laughs> Um, so, years ago, when there were the huge London riots, um, after the killing of a black man in the UK, I think that was the time where people really mobilized and were able to see that this isn't just this foreign idea that police brutality happens in the US or in the other countries. This is something that's happening on our soil. And then not only that, do we also need to look at the legacies of slavery in the UK and be able to understand the role that has been played by a lot of these banks and our educational institutions and all these monuments that are surrounding us. Like, what does it mean to be in this country? What does it mean to be Black and British? And I think that especially within the last couple of years, there's been huge movements to be in solidarity um, with the Black Lives Matters movement in the US and to be able to have these cultural exchanges and be able to see where there are where there's synergy and where there are opportunities to learn from each other. We've gotten the um, camera stuff fixed. It, it took a second, but it's good now. Just, let's just check out the stream. It's, quick it's update. much nicer now. All right, good, um, good. <laughs> yeah, the, the lack of, of lag is, uh, is is really nice. Phew, okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Sorry, I was very distracted by yeah. that. Uh, go ahead, Robin. I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, no. I, I was just... Uh, another, another aspect of this I, I want to talk about is... Um, Specifically, the notion of, of pretrial uh, mm. detention. Again, I think, certainly, I think, like a lot of people, this was a problem. I didn't realize the extent of it until I learned about, like, Khalif Browder, right? Like, for me, that was that was kind of my light bulb moment of, like, that that could happen, um, where somebody could effectively be uh, just locked up and lose their childhood uh, while awaiting trial. Um, mm -hmm. And I would love to talk through a little bit, like the extent uh, of this problem. I think, again, a lot of times the conversation around uh, mass incarceration tends to, it, it does tend to concentrate around um, prisons for people who have been convicted of crimes. Uh, but that is, you know, kind of, not the tip of the iceberg, but the pretrial detention system is also massive in its extent, correct? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, like on any given day, there could be like 600,000 people um, in pre- pre- pre-child detention in this country. And the main reason why people are in pre-child detention is because they can't pay bail. And the bail amount could be, you know, something that's insignificant to you. Um, it could be like $100 or it could be in cases like California, we see people who have bail set to like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, right. So we see that this is just a way of, you know, criminalizing the poor in particular because there is a way that pe- uh, people are also, you know, they have charges added on top of their charges, um, whether they're right. stopped for, whether it's like their traffic, you know, a traffic light evasion or like something that's up with their car or something. Next thing you know, they were like, oh, this person was also aggress- aggressive towards the police officer. So let's add something else. So it's just a way of like buffering and adding so that the bail amount is going to be higher for that individual. Um, and they know that that person won't be able to post bail and then they will not be able to go back to be with their families. Mm-hmm. And then it's just a snow- snowball effect from there on. My um, one of the things I'm curious about here too is when you when we talk about uh, trying to, I, I guess I guess one of the things that, that's kind of hard to con- conceive of is the way you have to split that work between both pushing to advocate for the abolition of something like uh, pretrial bail to also just supporting those caught up in it in this moment. Um, how do you how do you as an as an organization like? try to tackle both of those things at once because i can it's easy to, to to think of a bail fund as just like okay listen we're going to stop the bleeding so to speak we're going to try to try to like get people money so that they can get out of of you know these cages asap and get back with their families but then you also on top of that have to do the work of advocating for legislation and, and organizations that will push against uh, pre-bail or pre-trial bail as a thing to begin with that must be really difficult yeah um i I think national bailout is strong in that it's you know of course a national organization that is has like local and grassroots organizers as as a part of it so while there can be people who are bailing people out in georgia right now Mm -hmm. there are also people who are part of national bailout who are policy experts right or people who you know work in advocacy and research we have a wonderful report that's coming out soon that will explain all the ins and outs of the bail system and why it shouldn't exist um so so because there's so many people like within our collective wear different hats it's all able to happen simultaneously um and i should mention that when we're talking about cages we're not just talking about you know jails we're talking about detention centers too we see them all as cages Mm -hmm. and we also see as you know even like ankle monitors we still we see that as part of like a legacy of incarceration that person is still not free if you're if they have an ankle monitor around them um so you, we're looking at all the different ways in which people are still monitored and surveyed do you do you uh, do you run up against um opposition to that sort of holistic view often from people because it it seems that that in other fields that i think we, we've spoken about here in the past there's a there can be a sort of um uh, a sort of pragmatism that that can be almost um, a defeatist or fatalistic pragmatism that says, okay, but wait a second, shouldn't we only focus on the people actually in jail right now, for instance? Um, do you do you encounter that at all? Not inside of the the, the, the uh, collective, but more broadly. And how do you respond to the, to, to a, a sort of that style of, of kind of cynical pragmatism? Um, I haven't encountered that. Personally, I'm sure my colleagues probably have, <laughs> but <laughs> how I would uh, respond is that, you know, if someone like has their shackle around their ankle and they can't see their families or they can't travel and they can't mm. engage in work how they usually would and just psychologically waking up and seeing that around their ankle. Right. And imagine if that's someone who was also like shackled while they gave birth to their children um, while they were incarcerated, like what do you think that would do to their yeah. mental state? Right. You know, what do you think that would do to their financial state? You know. You know, how can that person be whole? How can they really engage in society with that around them? Like, that's a very inhumane thing. And we know that it has, like, its legacy in slavery. Um, so what does that mean for a black body to still have the shackle around its ankle? Totally. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also love to, to, if people in the chat have any, any broad questions about national bailout or any of the work that you do, please uh, let us know and, and we can kind of read those off if, if we see some good ones. Um, 
Rob, as I go over to fight this other guy, please well, please take it away again. <laughs> uh... Well, I actually, I, I have been curious about a thing I've been observing on the stream, though, uh, Austin. Oh, okay. Um, sure. As somebody who's not played Dynasty Warriors in yeah. a minute, uh -huh. um, it did appear that at one point, uh, Cao Cao had, like, a machine gun. Okay, well, the listen, lots of, there are, uh, fiction is a, a mechanism by which uh, we make the impossible possible. Uh, and... <laughs> As we all know, uh, ancient China definitely had some sort of black powder weapons. Um, remember that podcast we did where I talked about how anime is sort of expressionistic? That's also true for Dynasty Warriors. Okay, perfect. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Catherine, I, I am curious. Um, you know, we've been we were talking on email a little bit around uh, our sort of gaming childhood uh, as, as well um, and I'm curious a little bit like did you have a Dynasty Warriors that you're into like is there one that like you remember playing a lot of uh, when, when you were a kid you said earlier you were playing on the um, were you a PS2 really person yes PS2 and I can't remember the name of the Dynasty Warriors like I don't know which number it was yeah, um, yeah. I but all to, I know I, is that yeah. I could play this for like yeah days. <laughs> <laughs> so I played I played a lot of Dynasty Warriors, um, but I think it only dawned on me recently that I wasn't actually good at it. Um, di like, what's that mean? So, I don't know what you mean. How are you bad at it? Okay. Look, <laughs> things would. It was like a recurring dream. Okay. Where I would be really badass. And I'd be riding around and like winning all these battles. Yeah. And like then Lu Bu would come out. Okay. Yeah. He's and then I would just known. be stuck. I well, would just be stuck. You, first of all, don't pursue Lu Bu. Lu Bu is uh, a god among men. You should know this by now. Uh, he and his legendary horse, Red Hair, cannot be beat. Um, but beyond that, I, I feel like that, that's that's just the true Dynasty Warriors experience. Is like you beat the hell out of a thousand guys and you get a thousand and one and that guy happens to like get the drop on you and and also is just is just you know unbeatable yeah i'm uh sorry, i think little... they're mentioning that the uh the camera's gone off i think oh. they want to know oh, that. Yes. <laughs> that was was that your camera what happened there i think so oh no yeah there was a flicker uh on the connection i can think i think the uh I think, I think might... the FBI is trying to stop the they, uh, they... conversation. <laughs> it's too powerful. <laughs> trying to get to the bottom of no the South Town machine gun situation. Uh, there we go. This is the next yeah. uh, tool to show up at radical protests. <laughs> God. Oh. Yeah. What do you think about about the the kind of um, uptick in protests this year? Um, has that been heartening to see? It's been it's been beautiful to see. Um, it's been beautiful to see people really just mobilize and go into the streets, especially in these difficult times. Yeah. Um, you know, during this pandemic, uh, to see so many people gathered across the country, but also across the world yeah. to just say that, you know, enough is enough. Yep. Um, at the same time, it's, you know, I think we've been holding on to a variety of emotions because as I said, like, <laughs> we also want the same kind of noise when black trans people yep. are killed. Yep. We need people to also move when that happens and then always to have the same kind of rage to be able to, you know, donate to bailout funds and to provide supportive services and to see black people as human beings, even when we're not being killed, especially yes. when we're not being especially. killed. It would be you know, cool. that, especially, it would be so good to feel like a human being, even when my life wasn't being yeah, threatened. Exactly. Just always. Like, yeah. we don't need these, like, sporadic workplace conversations. Like, now, all of, of a sudden, we want anti-racism training. No, like, yeah. we need you to be anti-racist always. We need you to be actively working through, you know, the internalized forms of oppression yeah. that you spew onto your employees. Like, that has to be a continuous process. Absolutely. Um, good question here from uh, from Emily, actually. So, uh, Emily, who you know from our email thread setting all this up, uh, the... Uh, sort of the, the project lead uh, for the mod side of Save Point. Uh, Emily has a great question here. I'm curious how the NBO Collective has responded to what seemed like an effort by centrist liberal types to muddy the message of abolition, this year especially, by pushing compromise, electoralism, 
uh, reform rather than defund, etc., that may distract from the bigger fight towards ending the prison complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we've noticed it, noticed it and we've just <laughs> like <laughs> loudened our voices even more that, you know, we're not bending. We're not trying to do any like training of police. We're not trying to <laughs> be friends with them. Yeah. We're not trying to you know, do a cookout with them. Uh, we believe that they shouldn't exist. <laughs> like oh. that's what we're saying. Like all of these like you know signs on the street, you know they're cute, but we uh -huh. want to move past that. We do not want these systems to exist because as long as they do, there will be continued violence. We're going to continuously be in that state of grief and trauma, and we're going to continuously see black bodies on the streets being killed if we do not stop this once and for all. Yeah. And by seeing the amounts of people that gathered on the streets, if that same amount of people come together and we join our minds together and we bring all of our gifts and our talents and our skill sets to the table, there's nothing we can't do. Right. Um, I think this is, this is probably not a question that a lot of our regular audience needs answered, but for people who might uh, be sort of coming to these topics uh, more recently, why is reform kind of a fool's game? Because uh, because I, I think if you uh, spend a lot of time in like liberal circles, there's a real like earnest conviction that you can create better processes, you can provide that better training, uh, you can create a more responsible and sensitive uh, like police state, as as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, but why like why won't that work? Uh, why ultimately do those sort of incrementalist approaches uh, end up foundering in your eyes? Because you can't reform something that was created to destroy you. Like, it's it's a waste of time, mm. you know, and of money. You know, billions are going into these systems and it's coming from our pockets, from taxpayers' pockets. You know, to think about trying to change or alter or, you know, make a prison cell more comfortable, like, or to provide education, but that person is still in a cage and that's still a human being, you know? You know, even as we look at animals in cages, like a lot of us were like, this is horrendous. Like, why is yeah. this happening to this animal? But then for some reason, there are people who think that animals should be in cages or people should be. Yeah. Um, we should fight for the liberation of all beings. Like people should be free the same way that animals should be free, the way that, you know, we should all have our liberty. Um, and, I, you know, I, I've studied psychology. That was what my first degree is in. And we look at all of these studies where, you know, you see how easy it is for someone to just literally pick up a gun and shoot something, especially like with all of this, like bias that white police officers have against black and brown bodies yeah. that, the training that they have, they are trained to see us as targets, and that's it. They're not trained to think that, oh, this person is unarmed, that this person may not be a threat. Mm -hmm. They see black, they see target, they see violence, and all of their bias and racism and their upbringing and conditioning comes to the forefront, and that's it. So there's no way to just change what has been ingrained in a system. Absolutely. Uh, that, I, I think that that ends up being I, I think the reason that that kind of line of thought has now come up over and over in this conversation that, that, that question again of the like oh but do we make small changes do we da 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 comes from a, a sort of exhaustion at least that I think I've felt dealing with people sometimes even people in my family often black people who don't see abolition as something even worth dreaming about because it seems so impossible um, and I'm curious, how do we, at, at that first level, start reaching people and, and convincing them that this isn't something that is impossible, that this isn't something that is a fairy tale, this is something that we can build, that we can work on? I think people need to believe in themselves a bit <laughs> more and to just believe in how their ability to resolve conflict and provide for themselves and right. you know, their community that if your needs were met, like even if you look on it from a personal perspective and the kinds of, we all have personal trauma and you know sure. hardships that we've been through. And if you think about like, hmm, if I had this need met, would this have happened? Right. Like for so many of us, like if I was, you know, had better housing or if I had, you know, more financial stability or if I had access to healthcare, maybe I wouldn't have been in.
I think we're I think we're coming back. You're back. We're back. Yep. We're back. We're back, and Lou Boo is about to show up and wreck me. So, uh, Rob, what was where, where were we? Do you remember where we were in this conversation? Um, we just uh, we talked about having uh, believing in human dignity and and the value of. Uh, of of starting at a place of understanding and belief that we can do incredible things. Oh, Lubu is about to show up and kick my ass. God damn it. Anyway, <laughs> human... <laughs> it's about to happen. This is good. Watch, all these people are going to run forward. I Lubu is going to be the game. other side. And Lubu is going to be killing like a thousand people. That's him. That's Lubu. I got to just go. You know what? We can cut the stream so, now. Listen. Collective action is really powerful, kids. Yeah. Uh, it's really strong. Um, and, like, Lubu isn't real. Lubu can't get you. Lubu can't stop the power of collective action. That's right. Because um, he was because he was actually too much of an individualist. That's right, true. For all his See, prowess. See, this is, look, this is a group of people standing up against collective injustice, or against injustice collectively. <laughs> also, this dude's just big as hell, and he can stand off against Lubu. So sometimes you, you, need, you need heroes to rally around, you know? Um, no, what I was actually saying before we lost we lost the stream was that a thing that I and I said this on the stream the other night too, but I'll say it again here because it won't be two a.m. when I say it. Uh, um, I think a thing that we forget, or think a thing that gets caught up in, um, it, that can feel overwhelming. I'm pausing the game to say this because Lou Boo is otherwise going to kill me. Um, <laughs> when you recognize that something like the unjust carceral system in the U.S. is a historical, uh, is historically made. It, it, it is, it, the, what it is now comes at the long path, at the end of the long path of history through historical material causes. And you recognize that a lot of those historical material causes included people vying for power so that they could shift the status quo to support the carceral system we have today. Well, that's a, in some ways is a level playing field because it means that this thing isn't ahistorical. It isn't universal. It isn't. It isn't somehow transcendent or true in a way that the model of of life that we want is is not. It isn't. It isn't more natural than a world in which these systems are abolished. And once you accept that, you can then build towards it with the confidence that someone else already built towards something. It's just something that sucks. Other people spent their lives building a broken and unjust system. We can spend ours doing the opposite. And mm -hmm. it, it's like moving a mountain in some ways, but like it, a collective action, collective work, bringing the stuff together. If you accept materialism, if you accept that the world is as a real thing with real people in it, where systems and individuals and structures all move together to create the thing that we call being, then then we can adjust what being is. We can adjust what the world is. We can change what society is. And I think that, like that to me is the core of my even in the darkest days. Even when I'm like, you know what, we might be we might be in a fascist state. We are probably in a fascist state. I could say, okay, but that that state could change, or or we can demolish that state, or we can change the world in such a way until it is something that, that people are benefited from instead of something that, that harms us. Anyway, I'm now going to go let Lou Boo beat the shit out of me, so <laughs> I'm all out of words. <laughs> this bring back, brings back so many memories. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Okay, okay. Let's just, let's just go for it. I'm just going to go for it, Lou Boo. I can get you. I know it. I believe in my ability to take down Lou Boo. Wow. His nah, lifeline goes down so slowly. It's so slow. small. I'm doing no damage. He hit me once. I'm at like two thirds of my health. This is a nightmare. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We're good. We're good. We're good. Sal, Sal, come help me out. Come on. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm in a corner. This is about to go real bad. I just need to avoid him. I just, where's my horse? Where's, where's my Dan horse? The, the horse real. is never there when you need it. You're right. Okay. Yeah, that is, isn't that the case? <laughs> right. I'm retreating. Righteousness is so, on our side. You're right. You're right, Sunjian. So here's my question, because this is this is why I ended up sucking at this game. Uh -huh. like, I hit this part in these battles oh. where Lubu is now fighting against you. Yeah. And like, first of all, I would either be so busy with him that like my army would just get rocked. Yes. And so suddenly I am the dynasty warrior uh -huh. against everyone else on the map. Yes. Uh, or I would try to crowd control, and Lubu would just like brutalize me uh -huh. uh, until until I'm lost. What 
What is the trick in a Dynasty Warriors game? Leave. What was I, what was the I thing done? I'm doing now, which is I don't so have you to. Don't got, you don't gotta beat him. I don't gotta beat him. I gotta go forward and. And wait, why is the outchan? I thought the outchan was on my side earlier. What is happening? Anyway, yeah, the the trick is just avoiding him, uh, and hoping that he doesn't kill Cao Cao. Also, now Cao Cao's here. We're good. We're good. We're good. I'm like really lit right now, though. It's not. It does not look good for me. I could mess up against even someone who is not Lu Bu and then just die instantly. <laughs> uh huh. And that's How is it? Yes. Yeah. Then stop hitting me, what? Okay, got some health back. I'm breathing. We're good. I'm just gonna keep moving forward. I'm gonna go slay this tyrant, and that's gonna be it. Uh, any other good questions from the from the chat? Or is everyone captivated by that showdown, the brief showdown with Lu Bu? Captivated <laughs> by. Uh... <laughs> yes, here's a good question. Yeah. Uh, sh uh... Sea monster art asked, "That's Lu Bu." Yeah. Uh, what? Oh, he's here. <laughs> he's here. He's here. Uh oh. He showed up again. This is no good. Okay, but I ra I'm in rage. Oh, he healed himself. Come on. Oh, I'm done. I'm he done. Do he got things. me. It's done. It's over. Oh wow. You're done. Such a dramatic death. Such a dramatic death. It does bring <laughs> us to the top of the hour. Uh, so maybe that's a, as good a place as any. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on. I can't imagine a better a better uh, way to spend my weekend than talking about uh, carceral justice, uh, you know, police and, and prison abolition, and also getting my ass whooped by Lu Bu. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, also, I think the stream may have just died again. No, on my side it looks no, good. It's, it's oh no, people are just saying F because I died in the chat. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Fair. I can see someone that just asked them if there's a way to volunteer with us, and yes. there is. Um, maybe I can just put my email address in the chat. I would or... say we should post that somewhere where it's. Ah. That. Is there a is there like that. a is there a more generic? Pl uh, Listen, it's your email address. If you want to get spammed, that's on you. <laughs> I do not. See? So, um, but if you go on our website, nationalbailout.org, you can email us there. And there are ways to volunteer. We're actually looking for people with all different skill sets to contribute um, because we need all of us to get this work done. Incredible. Uh, are you on Twitter? Is National Bailout on Twitter? Is there, a, is there somewhere people should follow you or, or the work that National Bailout is doing on social media? Yes, you can find us on Twitter, on Instagram, on all the things at National Bailout. There it is. All right, Rob, you're going to stick around. We're going to do some other stuff in a, once we come back, but we are going to go to break. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, we'll be right back again. The, the site to go to to donate is savepoint.stream. Uh, right now, we, what did we start at? What were we at when you came on? Were we at, like... 88,000, I think. We are now, yeah, we are at $88,000, which is unbelievable. $88,824. Uh, and so 14 cents. Now. So yeah, we're almost at 89. Incredible work, everybody. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep raising money for national bailout. We will be right back. <laughs> 